Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is often considered the first great American novel. Huck Finn has earned this title in spite of, or well, maybe because of, the controversy in which it seems to be continually embroiled. Suffice to say, Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, didn't intend for Huckleberry Finn to simply be a tale of two unlikely friends on an adventure down the Mississippi River. Instead, he told a story that makes us uncomfortable. But in doing so, he hoped for us to become more empathetic and morally aware people as we journeyed with his protagonists, Huck and Jim. Similarly, the 2019 film The Peanut Butter Falcon, which I'll discuss in my next video, shares a lot of DNA with the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. What if he's living the American dream and, you know, he just uh, ran into a bunch of hitchhikers, you know, like Mark Twain story or something? You like Mark Twain? Two diverging people brought together through an uncanny mix of coincidence and destiny undertake a perilous adventure towards freedom. But just like Mark Twain's novel, co-writers and directors Michael Schwartz and Tyler Nilsson's story aims higher than just escapist entertainment. On the contrary, if we really open our minds and our hearts, Huck Finn and the Peanut Butter Falcon are adventures that can make us better people. Trashy and Vicious This was the title ascribed to a short article pressed against the right-hand margin on page 4 of the March 19, 1885 edition of the New York Times. The opening sentences read, The Concord Library Committee deserve well of the public by their action in banishing Mark Twain's new book, Huckleberry Finn, on the ground that it is trashy and vicious. It is time that this influential synonym should cease to carry into homes and libraries unworthy productions. After invoking Twain's lack of propriety by way of dredging up his infamous roasting of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and John Greenleaf Whittier, the piece concludes, saying, The advertising samples of this book, which have disfigured the Century magazine, are enough to tell any reader how offensive the whole thing must be. They are no better in tone than the dime novels which flood the blood and thunder reading population. Mr. Clemens has made them smarter, for he has an inexhaustible fund of quips and cranks and wanton wiles, and his literary skill is of course superior, but their moral level is low, and their perusal cannot be anything less than harmful. This was the first in a long series of bannings and challenges that would follow Huckleberry Finn. Often, the rationale for these bans centered on Twain's use of morally questionable irony and satire in the novel, like when he criticizes religious gullibility in an episode during which the Duke and King rip off an entire town at a church revival service, or the now famous moment when Huck, debating whether or not to do the quote-unquote right thing and turn Jim in, declares, all right then, I'll go to hell, and decides to rescue his friend instead. But many critics also vociferously condemned Twain's language, particularly his choice of writing and dialect, which was perceived as crude and demeaning, a bitterly incongruous critique considering that on the very same New York Times page which featured the Concord Library banning news was an article entitled Teaching the Negro, which describes the proposal of a charitable society to teach blacks living in the South to spell words based on how they sound rather than their formal spellings. The author asserts that there is no doubt that this system of teaching the Negro will greatly smooth his path and that it will hardly fail to meet his views. Ideas like this that reinforced absurd and racist black stereotypes ironically highlight the most enduring criticism of Huckleberry Finn, Twain's copious use of racial slurs throughout the novel, especially nigger, which appears 219 times. In 2011, New South Books, a small publisher in Alabama, under the guidance of Auburn University professor Alan Gribben, sought to sanitize Huckleberry Finn by publishing a new edition of the book, which replaced the word nigger with slave. Are you censoring Twain? We certainly are accused of censoring Twain. Randall Williams is co-owner and editor of New South Books, publishers of the sanitized edition of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn that replaces the N-word with slave. It's aimed at schools that already banned the book, though no one knows how many have. The controversy that ensued stirred up old debates about the place of Huckleberry Finn in American culture. Naturally, most of these debates revolved around the character of Jim, an enslaved person who escapes and journeys with Huck in hopes of attaining his freedom. 
Many scholarly analyses of Jim view him as essentially a stock character designed to progress Huck's moral development in the story, instead of a fully realized and deeply human character in and of himself. This diminished view of Jim is also, unfortunately, reinforced by the illustrations that accompany most editions of the novel, in which Jim is portrayed in a variety of grotesque and stereotypical images. But if we are going to become better people through the experience of reading Huck Finn, then it's crucial to see the profound and complex humanity in Jim, as well as Huck. Another common reading of Jim is that of a character who wears a mask. As Dr. Cassandra Smith, professor of English at the University of Alabama, observes, Jim is an illustration of the kinds of social maneuvers African Americans adopted to navigate a larger, hostile world. While such an interpretation has some merit, it also has problematic implications. For example, the image of a mask can evoke the blackface minstrel shows common in Twain's era. Masks also imply the trope of the trickster character. As Smith asserts, this substitution of stock representations, minstrel versus trickster, does not reveal his humanity more clearly. Rather, it prevents us from understanding Jim as a complex character driven by the same kind of emotions and moral dilemmas that plague Huck. The mask makes Jim conniving, selfish, even a little sinister. The mask allows him to dissimulate, effectively hiding the very humanity Huck must perceive in order to recognize his own. It leaves very little room for sincerity in their relationship. While the presence of a mask is vital to understanding Jim's character, its absence is equally crucial. Thus, in order to understand Jim and be affected by his experience more meaningfully, we must take a close look at the moments in which his mask comes off, and we're able to glimpse his own character development most clearly. A pivotal and revelatory episode occurs in chapter 15, in which Jim and Huck are separated on the river by darkness and fog and what is, for Jim, an especially traumatic experience. When Huck finds Jim again asleep on the raft from exhaustion, Huck decides to play a prank on him, pretending that the night's toil and terror was all just a dream. It's hard to say whether Jim is temporarily convinced by Huck's prank or just playing along, but either way, when Huck points out the leaves and rubbish on the raft, the physical evidence of Jim's desperate efforts to find Huck, his joking crosses a line into caustic meanness. As Jim's emotions rise, his mask falls away. He looked at me steady, without ever smiling, and says, What do they stand for? I was going to tell you. When I got all wore out with work and with the calling for you and went to sleep, my heart was most broke because you was lost and I didn't care no more what become of me and the raft. And when I wake up and find you back again, all safe and sound, the tears come and I could have got down on my knees and kissed your foot. I was so thankful. And all you was thinking about was how you could make a fool of old Jim with a lie. That truck there is trash. And trash is what people is that puts dirt on the head of their friends and makes them ashamed. What makes Jim's rebuke remarkable is that he is actually pointing out a moral deficiency in Huck. Moreover, Jim stands to gain nothing from this admonition of a white boy. But in fact, Jim gains something precious. Respect. As Huck reflects, It made me feel so mean. I could almost kiss his foot to get him to take it back. It was 15 minutes before I could work myself up to go and humble myself to a nigger. But I done it. And I weren't ever sorry for it afterwards, neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks. And I wouldn't have done that one if I'd have known it would make him feel that way. Other instances of Jim unmasking himself illustrate an important aspect of his moral character, namely his affection for children and instinct to protect them. Early on in Jim and Huck's adventures, the two come across a flooded house with a dead man inside, later revealed to be Huck's father, Pap. Jim is careful to prevent Huck from witnessing the gruesome image. Later on, Jim openly challenges the wisdom of the biblical figure King Solomon, in particular, Solomon's solution to settle a custody dispute by threatening the life of a child, a solution that strikes Jim as deeply repulsive and immoral. 
In an especially moving scene from chapter 23, Jim opens up to Huck about the time he struck his four-year-old daughter for not listening to him, and the terrible shame he felt after discovering that a recent sickness had caused her to go deaf. And all of a sudden, I say, pow! Just as loud as I could yell. She never budge. Oh, Huck, I bust out a crying and grab her up in my arms and say, Oh, the poor little thing. The Lord God Almighty forgive poor old Jim. Guess he never going to forgive himself as long as he live. Oh, she was plum deep and dumb, Huck. Plum deep and dumb. And I'd been a-treating her so. It's worth pointing out that Twain closes the chapter with this dialogue from Jim. Significantly, he doesn't offer up any form of reaction from Huck, thus leaving Jim's deeply felt words to speak entirely for themselves. All these revelations build to the ending of Twain's story, an ending that has often been criticized as seemingly aimless, contrived, and regressive. Scholars have noted that Jim's character in particular appears to settle back into a stereotype as he acquiesces to Tom Sawyer's increasingly ridiculous escape plans. But when events take a turn from the absurd to the deadly serious after Tom is shot in the leg, Huck, and especially Jim, are thrown into the most dire moral conundrum they've yet faced. Two aspects about this episode are striking. First, as Laurel Bollinger points out, when faced with the question of what to do to help Tom, Huck defers to Jim for the answer. Jim instructs Huck to fetch the doctor, while he will look after Tom. Jim conceals himself as the doctor arrives and attempts to treat Tom's wounds. However, as the doctor himself reports, And I see I couldn't do anything at all with him, so I says I got to have help somehow. And the minute I says it, I'll cross this nigga from somewheres and says he'll help, and he done it too. He done it very well. Here, Jim makes a moral choice that puts him in direct conflict with his own self-preservation. This conflict is a result of the fact that, as Smith puts it, Jim has been forced to operate within the dehumanizing parameters of enslavement. Smith offers further analysis of this scene that is both insightful and sobering. She writes, Jim experiences a rejection at the end of the novel, when the other characters fail to see his humanity and instead discuss his actions in terms of his increased property value. This kind of social blind spot makes Jim's story much more pessimistic than Huck's. Huck has the option of lighting out for the territory. Jim has no real escape route, which is why the novel ends where it begins for Jim, with him struggling to negotiate his own humanity and wearing a mask constantly at odds with that humanity. This conflict presumably will continue for Jim. Even if he is able to reach Cairo at last and buy freedom for his wife and children, he cannot outrun social invisibility. Nigger is a state of being that Jim cannot escape no matter how human he is, no matter how closely he might reflect the political, intellectual, social, and aesthetic values of the larger white American world which is perhaps Twain's greatest social critique. For sure, that critique remains in the novel even if the word nigger does not, perhaps referring to Jim only as a slave offers readers an out that Twain never intended. Our attention doesn't have to go far to see how this social invisibility has insidiously persisted through generations, and how attempts to sanitize Huck Finn and similarly misguided efforts to reframe the sordid history of race in America fail miserably to cleanse the injustices our society is soaked in. We should not have to do this day in and day out. We are going to demand change. And we are not Although Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was published 20 years after the Civil War, the novel is set 20 years before it. So even in its first edition, the novel looked into the past in order to hold up a mirror to the prejudices of the present. Huck and Jim take us on a journey and challenge us to look beyond the surface of the people around us to see the humanity, the struggle, and the value of each person. Even Mark Twain himself seems to have taken this lesson of his own novel to heart. On December 24, 1885, Twain penned a letter to the dean of Yale Law School, advocating for a young black student named Warner T. McGuinn and offering to pay his expenses. In the letter, Twain wrote, I do not believe I would very cheerfully help a white student who would ask a benevolence of a stranger, but I do not feel so about the other color. We have ground the manhood out of them, and the shame is ours, not theirs, 
and we should pay for it. McGuinn went on to be the first black graduate of Yale Law School, built a successful practice in Baltimore, and perhaps most remarkably, was a mentor to Thurgood Marshall, who later famously argued Brown versus Board of Education and would eventually become the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. Of course, all of these events might have transpired without Twain's personal generosity, and Twain himself was a mixed bag on racial issues. For example, as Shelley Fisher Fishkin points out, while Twain affirmed and supported the intellectual or artistic aspirations of a number of young black men like Warner McGuinn, he still retained a lifelong affection for the minstrel shows he recalled from his Missouri childhood. Nevertheless, there's still something salient about Twain's rebuke of racism and the systems that sustain it that we can't and shouldn't ignore today. If we look through America's history since the words of Huckleberry Finn first met the eyes of readers, we can see how the country has been on the same kind of journey that Huck and Jim experienced. One filled with both friendship and conflict, understanding and confusion, victory and defeat, joy and pain. It hasn't been easy, and likely won't be anytime soon, but if we strive and persevere, by journey's end, we can all be free.